Oh, how you doing, guys? How you doing? All right. You okay, Ron? It's okay, Ron. Oh, la, 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 Oh, rumbles on. Baramis, what's up, man? Baramis, Baramis. I got to do some shoulders, man. I got to get some muscle back. I don't care if I look bigger. I got to do muscle to get my tone. Muscle burns more calories. So pray for my discipline, guys. Oh, oh, you see that? I'm burned right here. You see that? Oh, man. See that right here? Look. You see that burn? Well, oh, I got burned. I burned my skin yesterday. Damn. I got to put some talking about. What's up, Pope? What's up? How's everybody doing? You know the rules, right? First, hit the like button, please, for algorithm. Subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, share this on your social media platforms. Why you want to talk to me about orthodoxy? Uh, I don't know what they don't understand, guys. Guys, can you help me? Maybe I'm a little slow. What kind of dream you had about me? Someone had a dream about me? Good. J-Man, good. That's good, man. All right. I don't know. Here's here's the question. Yeah, I'm going to start hitting weights again, Paul. I used to be a body in the 90s, but problem is I hate when I look bigger because it makes me feel like I'm getting fatter, but I got to do it. Pray for my healing and destroy my pride and arrogance and ego. Anyway, why are you going to ask me about orthodoxy? Guys, help me understand. I'm a little slow. I am slow, but if you have an Orthodox church, you have an Orthodox church, or you have a Catholic church, why aren't you going to them and asking them the questions? Why are you coming to me? I don't get it. Maybe I'm a little slow. Can you guys help me? Why would you ask me questions about the Orthodox faith or the Catholic faith? When you're going to an Orthodox church or a Catholic church, and that's why the priests are there to answer your questions. Secondly, I want to say this again. September is a great month, David. September is a great month. And in fact, I don't know if you know this. What's up, Tony? All right. Secondly, why are you coming to me asking me about your personal issues and lives? when That's why you have a church. Let me explain to you the church. The church is a spiritual hospital. Jesus, our Lord, the great physician. Yeah, I'm going to zoom you out. Okay, capitals and you get zoomed out. Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Savior Jesus Christ, the great physician, he has a hospital. It's called the church. In that church, he has his doctors. They're called bishops, priests, right? And the nurses, those are the deacons, right? So now, because he has a hospital, and there are surgeons, doctors, and nurses, bishops, priests, and deacons. You go to the hospital, you go and tell the surgeon or the doctor, or the deacon, most likely, I mean, the nurse, I'm sorry, you go to what's ailing you, that's called confession, and then the doctors, the nurses, will give you the medicine. Why are you contacting me and telling me? about your personal issues. I'm not a priest. I'm not a bishop, an evangelical Christian. I'm not a pastor. I'm a servant of the church, a servant of Jesus Christ. I teach you the Bible and related topics on learning the core doctrines of the Christian faith and pray by the Holy Spirit. I can go into in-depth exegesis by the Holy Spirit qualifying me to do so. But you and I both need the church. I need to get to the church more often. I need to get to you, Chris, myself. I'm not a priest, I'm not a bishop. <clears throat> I'm not your counselor. That's why you have a church. The church is there. You have your bishop, you have your priest, you have the deacon. You go to them. You tell them your struggles. I'm struggling with lust. We all are. May God keep us pure. Uh, I did this. I need the Lord have mercy on me. What? That's why they're there. How you doing, Magdalene? How are you, sister? 
You want me there? So please do not come to me with your personal issues because I'm not a priest. I'm not a bishop. I'm not even a deacon. And I would not be a deacon. I would not be a priest bishop because I'm not qualified. And secondly, the reason why I don't want to be a deacon or a priest or a bishop, because that will bind me up. Then I'll be bound that I can't visit other churches. For example, if I become, let's say, an Orthodox deacon, I can't go to the Catholic church and serve there with Christians. Or if, let's say, I'm a Catholic priest, I may not be allowed to go to the Orthodox Church. Same with the Assyrian Church. So I don't want to be bound. I want to be free. I go to the Catholic Church. I'm in the Catholic Church, but I want to have the freedom that I can go to the Orthodox Church. I can go to an Orthodox Church Bible study and teach if they want me to. I can go to the Assyrian Church. Assyrian Church. I can go to an Evangelical Church if they'll have me. So I want to have that freedom because I don't want to add to the division and I don't want to alienate and ostracize. I want to be used of the Holy Spirit, if the Spirit is pleased to use me, to bring true healing to these ancient churches that used to be one. Ancient healing that used to be one. You get my point? Ancient churches, I should say, that used to be one. May the Holy Spirit save me from error, from stammering, stuttering, from my lisp, destroy all error in me, mistakes, guard my tongue and mouth, Purge our tongues and mouths to never betray, deny, blaspheme the name of our God, and destroy every form of idolatry and blasphemy. So you understand now? Now someone is shocked. They say, oh, the church is a spiritual hospital. Yes, let me show you. Yes, let me show you. And by the way, I have a debate here. Lord willing, the reason why I did this session a little early, it's now 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to be debating Stacy Tuberville on Unitarianism. Pray God will anoint me, fill me with perfect recall of every jot to the portion of Scripture. Perfect exegesis, strengthen my tongue to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, destroy the lies and blasphemies, but do it respectfully because he's a sweet guy. I've already discussed with him. He's a sweet guy, and I hope he comes to the fullness of the truth. But let me show you where the Bible says the church is also a spiritual hospital. You ready? Matthew 9, verses 9 to 13. Matthew 9, verses 9 to 13. You ready? Matthew 9, verse 12 specifically. Here. So why do you come to me, guys? You have a church. If you're evangelical, you have your pastor that you trust is the man of God appointed over your soul. You have the bishops, the priests. You have the deacons. You go to them. Not me. I'm not a priest. I'm a Bible teacher, and I hope the Holy Spirit qualifies me to be such. An apologist. I apologize for being this good looking. Go to them. Don't tell me about your struggles. You need to go to confession. I need to go to confession. Go to there. You get it now? Focus, everyone. You get it now? Here. Matthew 9, verses 9 to 13. Notice what verse 12 says. Here you go. Matthew 9, 9 and 13. And as Jesus went on from there, Matthew 9, 9 and 13, he saw a man called Matthew. He saw a man called Matthew, pay attention, sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he stood up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and the disciples. Now, if you don't know the historical context, these are individuals that the religious authorities looked down upon, condemned, and marginalized. Moreover, if you were a Jew and you're a tax collector, you were considered a Judas, a Benedict Arnold. A Judas, a Benedict Arnold. Why? Because that means you, a Jew, are working for the oppressors who oppressed Israel, who had taken the land of Israel and taxing your people to help these oppressors get rich off the back of your people. So you're considered a Benedict Arnold, a Judas. You with me there? You see? So here, the religious authorities are saying, look at Jesus. He claims to be a prophet of God and he's holy. And yet, look, he's sitting with tax collectors and sinners. People that we wouldn't even affiliate with 
associate with, right? Because they're contemptible. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collector sinners? Now watch verse 12. When Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Those who are sick. So you see that, folks? Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the great physician. He's our healer spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically. He heals us completely. He gives us wholeness, not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, psycho psychologically. He came to heal our ailments, heal our minds, our emotions, our hearts, not just our bodies, the whole person. Jesus wants you to be whole spiritually, soulishly, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. So you see right there, our Lord says, our Lord says he's the great physician. Well, what is this hospital? The church. What is his medicine? The Eucharist. That's what even Ignatius said. And I'll show it to you. Ignatius said that. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. These are the people who need me the most, who need me badly. Those who are spiritually sick and diseased. They need me desperately. And I came to heal them because they're my creatures. I don't marginalize them or oppress them. We got it now? Everyone got it? So what do you think the church is? The church is there as a hospital for the sick. And so when people tell me, well, I don't like to go to church because they're a bunch of hypocrites. But you go to your work, right? You go to work to get your paycheck and there are a bunch of hypocrites there. You go to school to get a degree, and there are a bunch of hypocrites there. So when it comes to your financial well-being, you don't mind the hypocrites as long as it pays your bills and gives you an education. Well, why would you use that as an excuse to stop going to church? And secondly, if the church is a spiritual hospital, listen to me, why are you shocked that you find spiritually ill, diseased people and spiritual diseases takes a variety of forms? One such spiritual illness is hypocrisy. What do you expect to find hospital? Well, people, you expect to find hypocrites, immoral, fornicators, adulterers, idolaters, covetous, because these are spiritual diseases, illnesses that Jesus came to heal, and these people are spiritually sick, and they need to go to church to be healed. Yes, Theodore, I'm going to read it in Greek right here. The Greek says, your mother's a spiritual whore. The Greek says you're a spiritual bastard and that your father is a Shia who did muta with your mother. Okay, that's what it says in the Greek. You filthy bastard, son of Satan. Right? So why do you expect, or sh I should say, why wouldn't you expect that in the church you're going to find bastards like Theodore? Spiritual whores like Theodore. Sons of spiritual whores, the whore of Babylon like Theodore. He's a bastard. He's a filthy scum lowlife, an arrogant narcissist, piece of garbage. So you're going to expect these bastards to be there like Theodore. Right? So you got to tolerate it because Jesus is going to heal this bastard of being a spiritual narcissist, son of a spiritual whore. Right? So we got it right there. Everyone got it? You see it, right? So it's right there. So what does that mean? I'm not a bishop. I'm not a priest. I'm not a deacon. This is not a church. It's not a church. It's not a church. Don't you take this as a church. This is an online YouTube ministry to teach the Bible, refute heresies, equip you. You need to be in church, and I need to be in church, and God have mercy on us when we fail. Okay? Capish? What is the medicine that the Lord gives us? Well, let me show you. Let's go here. I'm going to show you Ignatius. The medicine that the Lord gives us. Here, Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, Syria, who was trained by the apostles, appointed by them, who died as a holy martyr, who's now glorified with Jesus. Ignatius, watch here. What's the medicine that he gives you there? Confession, 
so that you can be diagnosed and then your medicine. Right here. Ignatius, right? Here you go. Ignatius, chapter 20, promise of another letter. Epistle to the Ephesians. Epistle to the Ephesians, right? All right, look what he writes. You ready? You guys ready? Look what he writes. This is Ignatius. Watch here. If Jesus Christ shall gra graciously permit me through your prayer, see, Jesus will act upon your prayers, and when you pray, he will then bring about your requests because he loves you if you're righteous. I mean, he loves you when you're a sinner, but he comes to make you righteous, and the more righteous you are, the more powerful your prayers. And if it be his will, I shall in a second little work, which I will write to you, make further manifest to you the nature of the dispensation of which I have begun to treat with respect to the new man, Jesus Christ in his faith and in his love, in his suffering and his resurrection. Especially will I do this if the Lord make known to me that you come together man by man in common, through grace, favor, individually in one faith. You act like one new man, one body, not divided. And in Jesus Christ was of the seed of David, according to the flesh, being both the son of man and the son of God, so that you obey the bishop, there's your hospital, surgeon, the presbytery, the doctors, with an undivided mind, breaking one and the same bread, which is the medicine of immortality, the antidote to prevent us from dying, but which causes that we should live forever in Jesus Christ. The bread that you break, which would be the Eucharist, is your medicine. It's your antidote. Right? You and I, DJ, pray for me to get there too. Right? Pray. We got it here? So, do not come to me with your personal issues. I'm not your priest. I'm not your bishop. Do not ask me about the Orthodox Church. Go to the Orthodox Church. Don't ask me. Go to Catholic Church. Why are you asking me? Well, I want to be Orthodox. I have some questions. Well, go to the priest. You with me there? No, it's a fact. I'm trying to be humble. God the storm of pride and arrogance. I suffer with pride because low self-esteem is a sign of pride. May God heal me of it. It's just, you don't know how many messages I get. People want to tell me their problems. I'm not a, guys, I'm not a counselor. It's not I don't care about you. That's not my role. You understand? That's why you have a church. You're asking me to be your bishop and replace the church for you. That can't happen. I cannot replace the church for you. And I'm not your bishop. Right? You, you understand? Yep, pride cometh before a fall. Exactly, Swift David. So anyway, are we ready now to begin? Because I have to go live. That's why I'm doing this a little earlier. I have a debate. Pray God will give me the power, the anointing, call scripture perfectly, demolish the live Unitarianism, glorify the Lord Jesus, and do it graciously. Because Stacy Tuberville, he's a sweet guy. He has changed his position. There's hope for him. Pray God will store my pride and arrogance so I don't get puffed up. Pray God save me from my flesh. I'm not better than men who have fallen. May the Lord not hand me over. So let me show you where you find the debate. First of all, if you go to my YouTube channel, I already had a discussion with him. He used to be a modalist. Now he's a strict Unitarian, meaning he believes that Jesus is just a man, no more, no less. Before, he was a modalist. So he's changing his position. And he believes in full preterism, which is a damnable heresy, that Jesus will never return physically, bodily to the earth. Damnable heresy. But if you put Stacy Tuberville, T-U-B-E-R-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, there it is. Discussion debate with one of Stacy Tuberville. Right? Right here. Pray my face is that skinny again. You see how skinny my face was? Because I was doing a lot of cardio. Pray God to serve my pride. I just... Struggle with obesity, and it scares me. May God heal me. Please, Lord, in your mercy. Two years ago. It's right there. You see it? I'm debating him, but he's no longer a modalist. He changed his position. He's a nice guy. 
If he changes position once, there's hope he'll change it again. So then you go here, standing for truth. Standing for truth. Boom. And here it is. And then September, I pray I demolish another heretic for his lies that Jesus is the father, this heretic. We're already discussed with. May the Lord humble him, use me to crush his lies. Glory to the Father and Spirit. Here it is. Stacy Tubaville. Let's get you doing. Where is it? Right here. So I'm going live, Lord willing, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Here it is. Eastern Standard Time. Pray God keep me humble, teachable, and gracious, and not get buffed up and destroy his blasphemy. Lord to the Father and Spirit. No, actually, handmade Leah. Even though I'm addicted to sweets, the way I eat now, intermittent fasting, I try to do that six days a week, try, and I'm eating protein cookies, low in sugar, high in protein, for my sweet tooth. So, yes, I am addicted to sweets, but because of this, I get like Atkins bars or Quest bars. Anyway, there's the link. You guys got the link? Shared it with you, right? And for you guys on Rumble. So that's going to go live at 8 p.m. That's why I did this early. Okay, so there you go. And I remind you, that this is not the church. Let me remind you, this is not the church. Let me give you scripture. Pray for me. Believe it or not, one of the hindrances that Satan uses. You guys probably don't know this, but I'm asking for prayers for your prayer words. One of the hindrances that Satan uses, because I have such what they call body, is it dysmorphia? Because I have such a hatred for my body. And because I get paranoid of being obese and I look fat, I don't even wear pants anymore. Okay, let me just be up front with you. Because when I wear pants, I feel like they're tight on me and I feel like I'm getting fat. And then I get depressed and I want to hide myself. Believe it or not, you may think it's a petty excuse, but I'm being honest. Satan uses that to hinder me from going to the church because I feel like I'm uncomfortable. I'm so I try to go through the weekdays when the crowds are less. Pray for me. I need healing, guys. I'm damaged. I, re I am damaged. I'm not trying to appeal to simply. I'm just letting you know. I'm damaged. I do, want, I do I want to be like this? No, but I understand God's wisdom. Why does God allow me to suffer with these issues and battle these demons? I really am convinced it's because this is how God keeps me humble. I really am convinced that the reason why the Lord has not healed me of this to keep me humble. You with me there? So I don't get puffed up. Can you imagine if I didn't have these issues, how arrogant I could be? Imagine I have pride now. Imagine how bad I'd be. May Jesus keep me humble, crucify my flesh, and own me. So I understand, but it's I'm going to struggle with this till I die. Now, let me give you a reminder. A reminder. Let me give you a reminder. What scripture says. What scripture says. All right. This is not your church. Go to church. Here you go. A reminder. When we practice what we preach. Hebrews 10, 23, 25. Do not make this your church. You too, Elijah. Elijah, pray for me and God heal you and I. So you understand what the hell I go through, right? The mind, man. When I wear certain clothes, I get depressed. Certain pants, I get depressed. Let us hold fast. Hebrews 10, 23, 25. We're going to begin. But I'm trying to remind you. Look at this guy. All right. Okay, watch here. Hebrews 10, 23, 25. Mods control the demons. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. Stay faithful to the faith. For he who promises faithful. You know Jesus is alive. He lives and he will return to reward you if you endure. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let's encourage each other to love more, love Jesus more, love one another more, and prove it by deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. Do you see it? Do you see it there? Do not forsake assembling locally with believers which is called the church. See it? Thank you, Immortal. Pray for my discipline. I try to do a lot of cardio. So at least I don't become obese. You see it there? 
but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Meaning, Jesus is coming sooner than later. If he was coming soon 2,000 years ago, he's coming sooner now, which he's passing in because he will return. He's real. In light of that, you know you're going to stand before him and give an account. That should put a healthy reverence here, not to get lazy, but encourage each other. Thank you, Roman. Appreciate that, brother. Okay, got it? Amen, Katerina. That's James 4, 17. May the Lord give me perfect recall. I've already jot to the poor scripture. But here's another caveat. Hebrews 13, 17. Sorry, 17. Why did I put 7? 17, dude, not 7. All right, watch here. Here's this. Here's where your bishop comes in. Here's where your priest comes in. You're, you're listening? Exactly, Splo. Because when you're not part of the flock, the church, and you don't have shepherds filled with the Spirit watching over you, you're out there wandering alone with no protection. So the wolves come and snatch you. That's Acts 20, 25 to 32. Exactly, Splo. And I'll show you that, Pastor, because you mentioned it. Obey your leaders. Okay, who is your bishop that you submit to? Who is the priest? And I'll be honest, there are people there who should not be your leaders. You think James White is qualified to be a leader? Let's be honest. Sorry, may God heal my heart, but I'm not going to be politically correct. He's a false teacher. Anthony Rogers, your leader, a false teacher who got caught lying and quoting forgeries, humiliate himself, called out for it, doubled down and hit like a dog instead of acknowledging his error. You want him as your leader? You want Jeff Durbin of Apologia Church to be your leader? Him? You These men, you want them to be your leaders? All right? Obey your leaders and submit to them. Here, look, Hebrews 13, 17, when we practice what we preach. For they keep watch over your souls, Flo. You see why? You're right. As those will give an account, meaning God has given you a shepherd to watch over you. And that shepherd is going to have to answer to the Lord for how he treated you. So they're going to be judged more harshly. But you, on the other hand, don't make it worse for them and harder for them. Because it says so that they will do this with joy and not with groaning. Don't make it a misery for them to watch over you. For this would be unprofitable for you. Not only will they give an answer for how they treat you, you'll be called into account and you'll give an answer for how you treat them. Hebrews 13, 17. Right? You right? You see it? Mattel, here, you want my Rumble account? Let me show it to you. I will be streaming the debate on these channels, God willing, because it allows you that feature. So here you go. Let me show you my Rumble account. Make Rumble great again. Less censorship, it's better. Here's my Rumble account for those of you on, on YouTube. So now we can begin. Okay, so do we get it now? There it is. There's the Rumble account link. Do we get it now? Let me remind you, I'm not your priest. I'm not your bishop. This is not church. Get to church. Get to your priest. I pray I practice what I preach. So we got it? Clear? All right. Some people say, well, my church is online. No, it ain't. It ain't your church. You know, and, you know, it's, you know, you know Jesus, I mean the Bible. That's all I need. What the Bible says, you need the church. In fact, let me give you one more passage. One more. Okay, watch it. One more passage to establish this point. All right. Paul summons for the bishops, the elders of the church of at Ephesus. Why does he summon them? Watch, because he's going to give them final instructions. Watch here. Why do bishops exist? Number one, because the Lord set it up that the bishops are the successors of the apostles. Why? Because the apostles are going to die. Well, who's going to take over the leadership when they die? The bishops. The bishops are the heirs of the apostles. The bishops take the place of the apostles. 
until the Lord comes. Now here, Paul, now from Miletus, Acts 20, 17, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Now watch, Acts 20, 25, 32, what does he say to them? And now, behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all. Why? The Lord will not hold me accountable for your blood. When I stand before Jesus Christ, the Lord will not hold me accountable for your blood because I've done my part. Sorry, Joel. Wrong guy. Sorry, Joel. Sorry. Because this jackass is barking like the dog and doesn't know how to shut up. Sorry, Joel. Are you there? Hold on. Sorry, Joel. Let me do this. Unhype. You're good. Okay. Keep barking, Bartos, and see I send you to Mike Winger. All right? You guys got it? All right. I will not be accountable for your blood because I discharged my responsibility to you. What was my responsibility? Here. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. I taught you the faith inside and out, what it is, how to live it out. So when I stand before the Lord, I will not be guilty for failing to teach you God's word thoroughly so you can now be equipped to lead the church now that I'm about to depart to be with the Lord. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. See, you guys see why the bishops are there? Do you see why the bishops are there? Black and white. The bishops were appointed by the Holy Spirit through the apostles to take over the leadership after the apostles went to be with Jesus. The bishops. And then they're going to appoint other bishops. Protestantism, what's your continuity with the apostles? All right? Because it has to go from apostles to bishops. They appoint bishops. They appoint bishops. They appoint bishops. And those bishops will continue preserving the church and the scriptures and the correct interpretation. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit made you. We apostles didn't make you. The Spirit worked through us, making known to us, He chose you to be a bishop because you're qualified and you're a man of integrity living the faith. To oversee. Oversee what? To shepherd the church of God. They are your shepherds. The church which God purchased with His own blood. Why? Why are they your shepherds? William, stop idolizing the Shia who did muta with your whore mother. You filthy whore. Repent, you whore. Just because the Shia sired you, you bastard, and gave birth to you because your mother is a Shia whore, repent, you filthy dog. Pit on you and your mother, that Jezebel whore. Pit, you whore. The Lord rebuke you, you fake. Which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves like William and his whore mother will come in among you, not sparing the flock. That's why this whore and his mother need to be exposed. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. You see why God gave you the bishops? Because wolves like William and his whore mother will come to destroy you, to deceive you, to mislead you into false doctrine like Greg Stafford, James White, Anthony Rogers. And even from among yourselves, some will fall away, taking people after at, with them. Therefore, be watchful, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Three years I taught you to faith fully. You see, you have to be properly catechized. You see, you have to be properly, properly catechized. You see it? You see that? They had to spend three years learning from Paul the faith inside and out and know the faith and live it out. You see? Three years. And now I commend you. Now I entrust you to God and to the word of his grace, the word that he gave you out of his favor because his word is used by the Spirit to build you up and to give you inheritance among all those who have been sanctified. See it? Who? The bishops. I'm not a bishop. 
right? I'm a Bible teacher and apologist. So keep that in mind, right? We now got it. And go read the letters of Ignatius. I did a session on it. He says, do nothing without the bishop. Do nothing without the bishop. Do all things with the bishop. But do you really want a James White to be your bishop? Let's be honest, man. Him? You want Jeff Durbin? Anthony, honestly, disgusting Bible butchers who teach a false system called Calvinist? Calvinism? Come on. All right, now with that said, let's pray. Name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but those from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. Use me as your mouthpiece. Do not let me be politically correct. And do not let me grieve you and shame you or disappoint Jesus or anger the Father. Control our tongues and mouths. Purge our tongues and mouths in your purifying fire. Destroy every form of blasphemy, idolatry from us. And do not let us betray our God, Father, Son, Lord Jesus, and you, Holy Spirit. Sanctify us, our, our loved ones, my daughters. Wash and purify, cleanse us, our loved ones, my daughters, in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And give me perfect recall of every jot, tittle portion of Scripture. Perfect exegesis. Destroy error in us and sin in us to practice what we preach. And love the Lord Jesus Christ, even unto death, until he returns. And do not allow us to fall into any scandal. We need you. We depend on you. We cling to you, Holy Spirit. Own us. And Holy Spirit, preserve the YouTube channel from being deleted. Rebuke these dogs and censorship. Own our ministries. Own our possessions. Own our lives. Own our loved ones, my daughters, and bring them to me. And feed us the flesh of Jesus Christ. Give us the blood of Jesus Christ. And perfect our sight spiritually and physically to see through your eyes, the eyes of the Lord Jesus, the eyes of Abba, Father. Enslave us to your voice in Scripture. Drown out all other voices in our lives, the lives of our loved ones, my daughters. To love you, Holy Spirit, to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to love Abba, Father, for the glory of the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, and your glory. And give us the greatest gifts, perfect faith in our God, hope in our God, perfect love for our God. By obedience and love one another, not to be hypocrites, destroy the beams in our eyes, destroy all fears, doubts, and unbelief, and double mindedness, and not to live double lives. And help me in the debate, Holy Spirit. Keep us humble and teachable, destroy fake piety and humility, destroy pride, arrogance, and ego, and covetousness, and lust. Set me free from impurities, lust, and food addiction. Set us free and enslave us to you and fill us with your fruits, your righteousness, your holiness, to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ and beatify us with the beauty of Christ. Give us strict discipline spiritually and physically. Speak life to my throat so that my voice will be powerful and pleasing to the ears of your servants. The health I need to serve the church and glorify Jesus Christ and help me to get to church. Help me, Holy Spirit. Heal me on my failures and vices and weaknesses and, and laziness and take over. To expose Stafford and his fake God, crush his fake God, muzzle Stafford as he manifests. And I ask Holy Spirit, be with us in the debate. Open Stacy's heart that he will come to the fullness of truth and help me to be patient, not shame you. Constrain us and control us to honor Christ and beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. So here begins John 8. I'm going to use John 8 to further expose Stafford's errand. By the way, have you seen he's manifesting again? He's manifesting. A guy saw that? Have you seen his latest? He's now putting up clips of arguments that I demolish and destroy but because that's all he has. He's repeating the same arguments. Jude 9, right? Zechariah 3. Did I not just do in-depth series demolishing and destroying his perversion of those texts? See, this is what I said. He has nothing new. It's the same arguments over and over again. He can't do any better because his fake God is being destroyed. His lies are being destroyed. Because the Bible is a Trinitarian book, the triumph God lives. Same thing, man. So he's now going to do a 1,000-hour session repeating the same points. All right. And you can thank Kelly Powers for these series because he went after Kelly Powers. Because Kelly Powers is a special kind of stupid. He's not qualified to teach, let alone be a minister. Man, I hope he's not counseling anyone in his church. 
He shouldn't even be doing apologetics, let alone ministering in the church. Truly, I mean this. I don't mean to be malicious, but I'm not going to be politically correct. May I never prostitute myself. None of us prostitute ourselves for numbers, for, for fame or money, and destroy our fear of not having enough for the glory of the Father and the Spirit. Anyway, because of him going after Kelly, because Kelly's too arrogant and proud to confess. What's up, my brother JP Uncut? I can't join you because after this, I'm going to debate Stacey Tuberville. Stafford went after him viciously. Viciously. And rightly so. But I'm going to go after Stafford because Kelly is a Trinitarian. So he worships the same God we do. Stafford doesn't, but Stafford's smarter than him. He went after him viciously about John 8, 58, which I warned Kelly. I said, Kelly, he's going to demolish you because you don't know the argument. Be that as it may, let's go into this. Now, I've already discussed these topics millions of times. But we're creature repetition. We hear something repetitively until it becomes second nature. In fact, I have linked to some articles relevant to John 8 and the I am statements. So let me show you where to find them. You go to YouTube. Go to YouTube. Right here. Go to YouTube. You go here. And look at the description box right here. Here are the articles. You see them? Description box, folks. You see them? All right, you see it? There it is. Let me enlarge a little bit. I got a problem enlarging. But then I'm going to show you where to find them on Rumble. Show you where to find them on Rumble. All right? So you go to Rumble. Let's get ready to Rumble. Anyway, ask the Lord to give me perfect constraint over my appetites. Intermittent fasting and fasting as worship. So there it is on Rumble right there. See it? There they go. Fathers on John 5, John 8, 58. I want to read, maybe not in this session, but I'm going to read what the early church fathers and theologians stated about John 8, 58, where our Lord Jesus says he is the I am. And thanks to, thanks to Stafford for trying to quote mine the fathers in his book. So that forced me to try to find the quotations to further obliterate his fake God, because his God doesn't exist. So you see, here's the article. How did the early Christians, the fathers, theologians, apologists, interpret John 8, 58, our Lord's I am statements? Here it is, right there. We have Irenaeus, Saint Church Father. Origen was not a church father. Gregory, Thaumat, Thaumaturgus, Seer of Jerusalem. Theodoret, Theodoret of Cyrus, John Chrysostom. Right there. Lengthy quotes on how they explain John 8, 58 and John 1. Augustine of Hippo. Novation, Novatian. There it is. Athanasius of Alexandria. Athanasius. See it? It's all yours. Take the articles. Take the sessions. Upload them. Translate them. Clip them. It's yours. Oh, September 11, Lord willing? God willing. We'll see. If I'm around, Lord willing, why not? But bring that guy, Chris, Chris S. He is a former member of that cult, and he's exposing that cult for the glory of the Lord. And here we have, right here, another article on this. Let's get ready to rumble. Christ Jesus, our Lord, and the I Am statements. Stafford does everything in his power to deny the divine significance, divine implication of our Lord claiming to be ego me. Anihu, Anokihu, right? So here it is. I am. Now, I have an excursus on this, meaning if you go to the bottom, I should link to it right there. So you guys want me to go into this, right? I guess I didn't link to it. So it's going to be at least three sessions on this. Do you mind if I do another, like, this is going to be part one on John 8. Then I'm going to do two other sessions. Seems like it's going to take me at least three sessions, Lord willing, to do a Thor job. Lord willing, I'll get back to ref responding, refuting Nasser and other topics. But I have an excursus on this. Here it is. So you can read the material in the meantime. You don't have to wait. Maraga, make Rumble great again. Here, I am saying in the earliest gospel, I guess here, I didn't quote the scholars. I do have an article where I'm quoting what scholars say. But anyway, it is what it is right here. In the earliest gospel, there's an ego I me, I am saying, which serves as a divine disclosure, disclosing Jesus' divine identity. 
And then finally here, this one. See? And I'm going to show you what I posted on my community section. Try to look at my community section daily, right? Daily, because I try to share links to my articles, rebuttals, or videos, or others that will be beneficial. So here it is. So now let's go to the community section. You guys learning how to navigate? Learning how to navigate? Okay, so let's go here. Go back to my YouTube channel. Let's get ready to rumble. You go here. Go to community section. Community section. Voila. Here's a series of posts refuting Unitarianism by using the Old Testament rabbinic sources to do so. Study info, use an ear witness, pass it on to others. To the triumph God, be the glory forever. I like this picture because someone took this shot and put Jesus saves. Amen, he does. So there he goes right here. Right here. Let me show you one of the other. Right here. Right here, right now. That's going to be the debate today. Right here, right now. Yahweh's, Yahweh's divine angel, eternal spirit. Right? Right here, right now, man. Right here. Right here, right now. Let me show you another one. How about this one here? This one was done to refute Stafford's lies. Right here, right now, Mr. Created angelic beings as Jehovah God. What? Say what? So you guys know how to find this stuff, right? You are thoroughly equipped and have no excuse not to know the biblical basis for the Trinity, Christ being God in flesh, for the authority of scriptures, the historicity, the historicity for the resurrection, other core doctrines related to your faith and morals, because it's all there. All you got to do is study. That's it. Sessions and articles, free of charge. What more do you want? Right? What more do you want? Yes, you can watch it on YouTube. And if you want, use a proxy service, see if you can see Rumble. What more do you want? Saints, you've been thoroughly equipped. You live, you live. At an age where God has spoiled you, all you do is pay internet, it's all free. And God raises up people, and I pray I'm one of them, and God confirms I'm one of them, to equip you by doing the work for you. Speaking of which, if you love Brad, Brent Pitri, I don't know why I call them Brad, I suck with names. Brent Pitri, an outstanding Catholic theologian and apologist, extraordinaire, wrote some great books. Guess what, guys? Catholics and Orthodox. This is for you too, and Protestants. Brad Brandt, Lord save me from my lisp. Petri just came up with this book. Jesus and Divine Christology. He now has a book on the massive evidence from the Bible that Christ is God in the flesh, equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus and Divine Christology. Brandt Petri. You got it? There you go. You like that? I'm going to be excited to get the book. Now, I can't wait for Incarnate Christ and his critics to come out. No New Year's Day. Get this guy again. Why you text him, bro? What's up, bro? I love you. Can I do my Stevie Wonder impersonation with it? Hold on. Let's see. Where is it? Where's my glass? Because I look fine with them damn glasses here. Fine. Oh, wait. You watch it. You ready? That is it. Here you go. No New Year's Day to celebrate. No month of May was so the words I don't know. Because what sucks about me is I rarely memorize. Words to songs that I hear repeatedly. But I just call to say, get this book. I just call to say, you will really like it if you read it. That's right. Oh, that's good for my neck. Hold on. Keep shining. Keep smiling. No, and you can always count on me for sure. That's what friends are for. 
for a good time. I'll be signing home. All right, let's begin. Okay, now ready? Let's go to John 8. Now, I would use the New World Translation. I would use the New World Translation. X J W Laura L A U R A X J W Laura. That's the one with you three. Her and her husband. But let me tell you why I can't use the New World Translation. Following the deceit and misinformation of modern textual critics who tell you that the woman caught in adultery, what's called the pericope adultery, found in John 7, verse 53 to 8, 11, was not written by John. It was a floating tradition that was added in John and later manuscripts, which is a lie from the pit of hell. I already have interview with James Snap showing you the evidence that shows that's a lie because they don't give you all the data. And he was supposed to come and do another session responding to Danny Wallace. But because he said something foolish and stupid unintentionally, I was afraid I was going to get banned because you can't use certain terms on YouTube. May the Lord protect you. I can't get a third strike. Anyway, because the Nora translation follows the views of modern textual criticism, I can't go to John 8 and start reading from verses 1 to 11. You know why? Here's their translation. They don't have verses 1 to 11. They removed it. And the Nora translation, following the views of modern textual criticism, they now have removed John 7, 53, 8, 11 from their Bible. So their Bible in John 8 starts at verse 12. See it? See it? So this is what they've been planning. They're planning to desensitize Christians, inoculate Christians slowly but surely with these devastating footnotes that misinform you to get you to the point where you're now ready, willing, and able and will accept the removal of these passages. That's what they want to do, Daniel Wallace and others. That's their game. I'm not lying. Daniel Wallace even wrote a post saying, my favorite story that's not in the Bible. That's just, in other words, he makes an argument. I love the story of the woman caught in adultery, but it's not scripture. It was added later. And if he had his way, modern Bibles would remove that section of scripture. See it? And so the New World Translation follows modern scholarly opinion. And they don't have John 7, 53 to 8, 11. See it there? It begins on verse 12. And they explain to you why right in their notes, right? See what they're doing? Not only that, modern textual scholarship will give you lies and misinformation. They don't give you the full story to get you to question the longer ending of Mark 16, 9 to 20, saying that Mark did not write it. It was added later. Again, thank the Lord for folks like James Snap. Go watch my session. Go to his blog. If you do James Snap on my YouTube channel, you'll see the session he did. And I link to his blog and his YouTube channel where he gives you all of the evidence. And he shows you the massive amount of evidence shows Mark did write Mark 16, 9 to 20. That's another lie. But now watch the neural translation. Since they follow scholarly opinion, when you go to their mark, and by the way, these are the textual variants that Bart Ehrman harps on and Muslims harp on. When you go there to Mark 16, their chapter 16 ends where? Watch. So don't let Satan catch you asleep. You cannot be slumber. You must be alive, awake, and alert. And ask the Spirit to protect you from the lies of scholars who even claim to be Trinitarians. Look where their Mark 16 ends. Verse 8. There is no 9 to 20. See that? Mark 16, verses 1 8. There is no verses 9 to 20. So in their Bible, they're doing what Daniel Wallace and others want to be done with future English versions of the Bible. They want to end up producing Bibles where Mark 16, 9 to 20 is removed. John 7, 53, 8, 11 is removed. They're working. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating. 
This is their goal. This is their goal. See it? Now, let me share some with you who are Catholics who follow the Latin Vulgate, which was the official Bible version of the church because Latin was the scholastic language of the West. The Latin Vulgate, based on Jerome's production, where he learned Hebrew and studied the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts available at his time, the 4th century, 5th century. And he then translated that into Latin. So that has become the official version of Latin-speaking Christians called the Latin Vulgate, meaning in the vulgar language, meaning common language for the common person. One second, guys. I got to shut up. I want to show you that in your Dewey Reigns version, which is the English translation of the Latin Vulgate, I'm going to show you verses that are in your translation that if you follow modern Catholic Bibles are no longer there. Or they have notes telling you these passages are not genuine. Here. Okay, you ready? Can I just, this is, again, we ask Holy Spirit to guide us. Ask Holy Spirit to guide us, and his will be done. These are all related to me refuting Stafford, because Stafford's going to come back and question the Percipe Adulterae, which is one of the most powerful witnesses to Jesus being Jehovah God Almighty. Okay, now watch here. Now let me show you the Latin Vulgate. I'm going to compare it with the New American Bible Revised Edition. You guys okay? You're learning? May the Spirit use me to guide us into the fullness of the truth and save us from error. By the way, William Albrecht will be with me tomorrow, Lord willing. Mark it down. I'm going to schedule it. William Albrecht is joining me, Lord willing, tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, Michigan Time, to demolish Mike Winger's recent attack on the Blessed Mother, the Holy Mother, calling into question her perpetual virginity. Lord willing, he's going to barbecue Mike Winger tomorrow, Lord willing. 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Michigan time, New York time. I'm going to set it up, Lord willing, later tonight. All right? So don't miss it. Now let's go to the Dewey Rames. Dewey Rames. 1899 American edition. All right? And I'm going to cross-reference it with New American, New American Bible Revised Edition. Watch here. Watch here. Okay, get ready. Now I'm going to do a New American Bible Revised Edition. Watch here. Which is a modern Catholic Bible influenced by textual criticism. Textual criticism done by Protestants. Okay? So Protestant scholarship has seeped into Catholic institutions and has affected Catholic Orthodox scholarship negatively. Okay? Watch here. Now I'm going to do the note. Watch here now. Mark 16, 8 to 20, right? Notice here. This is Dewey Reigns to the left. Watch here. This is now New American Bible, Revised Edition. Look, they have a note, longer ending. So let's go look at the note. Notice they put it in brackets. You see brackets? And brackets. Why? In brackets, note their note. Watch here. End of bracket. End of bracket. Even though 99% of our manuscripts of Mark have Mark 69 to 20, and Irenaeus refers to it as part of Mark, look at the note. This is your New American Bible Revised Edition. And they put this in brackets. Are you learning? Okay, watch this destructive. Catholic edition. This passage termed, termed the longer ending to the Mark and Gospel by comparison with a much briefer conclusion found in some less important manuscripts has traditionally, look, he's admitting the Catholic Church has traditionally been accepted as a canonical part of the Gospel and was defined as such by the Council of Trent. Early citations of it by the Fathers indicate it was composed by the second century. Did you see? How destructive this note is. You understand? The note is telling you that the fathers in the second century, like Irenaeus, quoted Mark 16, 9 to 20 as part of Mark. But they're telling you 
That means the longer ending was only written in the second century. If it was during the second century, Mark did not write it. Mark did not write it. You see, Catholics, what this new American Bible Revised Edition is doing to your faith? And that's why he, he they mentioned another lie with James Snap refutes. Because there are also terms in Mark 15 used by Mark, not found elsewhere in Mark, that no one questions their validity. But now watch here. Look at this misinformation, the lie. Although vocabulary and style indicate that it was written by someone other than Mark, going against what the Council of Trent taught. You got it? Because of modern scholarship coming from Protestantism. It is a general resume of the material concerning appearances of the risen Jesus, reflecting in particular traditions found in Luke 24 20. What they don't tell you is that 99% of the manuscripts have Mark 16 9 to 20. Irenaeus quotes it as part of what Mark wrote, not someone else. And this begs the question. If Mark wrote it, then that means it's part of Mark's vocabulary and style. You see the circular reasoning? It's because they assume Mark didn't write it. They're saying, well, there are words here not used elsewhere. Well, if Mark wrote it, that means it's part of his vocabulary and style. And besides, he's talking about resurrection appearances. Of course, it's going to employ a different vocabulary. You got it, guys? All right, but wait, what about the pericope adultery? Woman caught in adultery. The free Logian found after Mark 16, 14, a fourth, fifth century manuscript preserved in the Freer Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C. This ending was known to Jerome in the fourth century and it reads, anyway, you got it. Now watch here. John 7, Dewey Rames, right? Dewey Rames. You catch it here? Dewey Rames. Part of the text. Notice again, New American Bible, Revised Edition, they have a note. A, and notice they put this section in brackets. Brackets means they're trying to set it apart as not being part of what John wrote. See it? That's why they put in brackets. Okay, now watch the note. You guys are not bored with this, are you? Right? And brackets. Now watch the destructive note. You guys are okay. You're learning. So you can be warned. You guys have been asleep. But the Lord Jesus says, be alert. Be aware. Don't slumber. Because your enemy doesn't slumber. Be alert. Aware and awaken to the schemes of the devil. Because what did Paul say? Wolves will come in your midst. Masquerading as sheep. And from your own midst. That means you have wolves in our midst who will sound as if they're sheep, Christian, but they're introducing destructive heresies to destroy your faith and weaken your faith. Wake up, guys. Wake up. Oh, right, I watch here. Look at the note. This is a Catholic Bible. The story of the woman caught in adultery is a later insertion. Did you catch it? Later insertion. Go watch. By the way, William, we'll get James Snap on, Lord willing. Sometime after next week. Missing from all Greek early Greek manuscripts. You see? Misinformation again. A Western text type insertion attested mainly in old Latin translations. It is found in different places in different manuscripts. But they don't tell you that the reason why it's found in different places, number one, these are late manuscripts. And I believe from the 10th century. And the reason why they're found there because they were part of lectionary readings. See, they don't tell you this. James Snap will. Maurice Robinson will, who believe this is genuine. What do I mean? Those of you who go to liturgical churches know that every week the church groups portions of scriptures together as part of the reading for that Sunday. The reason why the woman caught in adultery is found in other places is because it's being attached to those passages that will be read on that day on Sunday. But they don't tell you that. They don't tell you that. See the misinformation? All right, now, 
Hereafter, John 7:36, we're at the end of this gospel, or after Luke 20 and 38. Go watch my interview with James Snap on this. He'll give you all this information. There are many non-Yohanine features. You see the circular reasoning. How do you know these are features that are not stylistic of John? If John wrote it, that means it's part of his style. You see how they try to deceive you? Well, see, we already assume John didn't write it, and therefore there are stylistic differences in this section not found elsewhere in John. But wait, if John wrote it, then it's part of his style, isn't it? Right? And there are also many doubtful readings within the passage. Why? If John wrote it, what's doubtful about it? The style of motifs are similar to those of Luke. And it fits better with the general situation than in Luke 21. No, it doesn't. It fits better because it's a similar theme, which is why the church grouped Luke 21 with John 7, 58, 11 for that particular Sunday as part of the lectionary reading. But it was probably inserted here because of the allusion to John 17, 13. Compare footnote on John 8, 6. And the statement, I do not judge anyone. Now watch, after destroying your faith, guys, Catholics, after destroying your faith in its authenticity, look at the audacity. The Catholic Church accepts this passage as canonical scripture. Now, Catholics, do you understand this note is bringing shame to the Catholic Church? Do you know why? Can I explain to you why? If they tell you these passages are not authentic, they were later assertions. But then they say, well, the Catholic Church says it's canonical. Mark 16, 9 to 20 is part of the canon, meaning part of Mark. John 7, 50 to 8, 11, part of the canon, part of John. That means the Catholic Church doesn't know what it's talking about. You understand? It's now putting a weapon in the hand of Protestants to say, see, you Catholics, so much for an infallible magisterium, because here your church declared these passages as part of the canon, inspired by the Spirit, and they're wrong. Ha, 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 ha. See what they did? They're destroying your faith in the Catholic Church. With friends like these, you don't need James White or Anthony Rogers. You get it or no? Are you, did it, you understand how satanic this is? So subtle because Satan, the serpent, is subtle. So subtle, right? Did it sink in before I move on? Because this is all preparatory for Stafford. So subtle, right? Al said, actually, you're a liar. You're a bastard. Your mother's a spiritual whore, the whore of Babylon. Aaron says, he was nothing akin to Tertullian, just a martyr. Now, if you're more man than your whore mother, I'll give you the link to come and debate me. Guys here, I'm going to give this coward a link. You're a spiritual whore. Your mother's a spiritual whore. You're a son of Satan. Eris is your father. Justin Martyr, Tertullian, bury your dog Arius and you. Now, let's see if you're a man. Come up. Let's debate Justin Mark Tertullian because I have the articles. But we know you're a dog like your mother, that spiritual whore of Babylon, you son of Satan. Pit on you and your father, Arius. Come on up, dog, you filthy lowlife scum. Prove to me, Justin Martyr. And Tertullian, Arenaeus, believe like your father, Arius, who's in hell, which is where you're going to be. You got the link, you son of Satan. Let's see if you're more man than your mother when she did muta with the Shia. All right, now watch this. Watch this. You ready? Guys, how many of you want to bet me this coward's going to return to his vomit and he doesn't have the guts to defend his fake God? All right, now watch this. Watch this. Dewey reigns to the left. Dewey reigns to the left. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What does hinder me from being baptized? Now notice, Dewey reigns, guys. Dewey reigns. Lepid, I'm going to block you and insult you. Al said, I don't care. The Shiite used to be watching your mother from my ABN days. Join the link, Al said, so I can bury you, you son of Satan. I'll use Tertullian, Justin Martyr, show you are a bastard, son of a spiritual order of Babylon, and that your daddy, Arius, is in hell, and you'll be in hell with him. Join, stop barking, because even the Shia were doing muta with your mother from my ABN days. Stop barking, you filthy scum, son of Satan, slandering liar. 
block this dog. He's got my link. He can show up. Now, for the rest of you, let pay attention to this. Okay? Watch here. Verse 37, Dewey Rames right here. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answering said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. New American Bible, revised edition. There is no verse 37. Do you see it? There is no verse 37. Do you guys see it? Did you see that? Folks, pay attention. Your Catholic Bible, New American Bible, revised, does not have 37. Your Dewey Reigns does. Now it has a footnote. Now notice this misleading lie. The oldest and best manuscripts of Acts omit this verse. Do you catch it? See, again, misleading. Because he doesn't or they don't take into consideration the early citation of this verse by the church fathers. The early Christians that cited this as part of Acts. All right, how about this one? 1 John 5, 7. Watch here. 1 John 5, 7. Do your aims. Do your aims. There you go. Do your aims. 1 John 5, 7. There are three who give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Omitted here. Omitted here. You don't have it. Oh, Revised Standard Version is just as bad, Adamis. Here, Revised Standard Version. Hold on, hold on, brother. No, 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 Adamis. No, 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 no. Don't deceive yourself. Here, let me show you. Let me change it now to Revised Standard Version. You guys think it's better? No, it's not. Here, watch. Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. Ready? What you talking about, Willis? There you go. This is Revised Standard Version. What are you talking about, dude? Sorry, not New Revised Standard, you little monkey. That's not what I did. Watch here. What are you talking about, sir? We're waiting for you, Al said. As a share, waiting for your mother. Watch here, dude. Talk, take it easy, man. All right? Well, this one here, let me see. Hmm. Because probably it's Catholic condition. Now, maybe the Catholic condition doesn't have you notes, but I'll show you. They have notes to this as well. There you go. Aramis, Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. There's your note. Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. Look. A and B, note. What are you talking about? It's better. Look, mister. Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. No, it's not. Look at the note. This passage is regarded as inspired canonical scripture, even if not. Written by Mark. As it is missing from some important manuscripts, it is possible that Mark did not write it. On the other hand, he would have would hardly have left his gospel unfinished at verse 8. Many think that the original ending was lost. You see what an insult to God preserving his word? So the original ending of Mark was lost at a very early date and that this ending was composed at the end of the apostolic period to take its place. Who deceived you, Adamis? What you talking about, Willis? Now watch here. What about John 7, 53 to 8, 11? What you talking about, Willis? Let's see the note here, Willis. Let's go to the note. Here it goes, the note again, Revised Standard Version. Some ancient authorities insert. Did you catch it? They insert either at the end of this gospel or after Luke 21, 38, with very ancient texts, all there's omitted altogether. This passage, though absent from some of the most ancient manuscripts, is regarded as inspired and can canonical by the church. The style suggests it is not by John, St. John, and it belongs to the synoptic. Who deceived you, bro? You don't read your notes. You guys are not reading your notes. That's why you think it's better. Who told you it's better, dude? How about Acts 8.37? There is no 37, dude. Look, Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. What you smoking, Willis? There is no 37. What? 37 here. And then it says here, other ancient authorities and, and all are most of verse 37. Who deceived you, dude? 
How about this one? Wait, wait. First John 5, 7. Ain't there. See what they're doing to you Catholics and Orthodox? See what they're doing to you? All right. Now let's see how the Revised Catholic Edition renders Isaiah 7.14. I'm just curious. Say what? Watch here. The Catholic Edition, because the other editions don't render it this way. Let me just check. Say what? Revised Standard I mean, yeah, Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a young woman will shall conceive. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. So even for your Catholic Bible, they didn't have the temerity to say virgin. And they leave it in a footnote. Or virgin, young woman. The Hebrew word Alma is not more explicit. So it only means woman. The Greek translates this as parthenos, virgin, and may be regarded as a witness to later Jewish tradition as to the meaning of the prophecy. The virginal conception is, of course, unequivocally stated in the gospel where the pro this prophecy is quoted. What? What you talking about, Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition is better? Are you in drugs, mister? Are you in drugs? How about New American, Stand New American Bible Revised Edition? Let's go back. Okay, watch here. How do they render it? You guys okay? You don't think it's a waste of your time, right? It's not a waste of your time, right? Okay, watch here. New American Bible Revised Edition. Say what? Here it is. New American Bible, Catholic, huh? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The young woman, pregnant and about to bear a son, shall name him Emmanuel. So they're telling you that woman is already there, pregnant. She's at the time of Isaiah. Isaiah's sign seeks to reassure Ahaz that he need not fear the invading armies of Syria and is in light of God's promise to David. The oracle follows a traditional announcement formula by which the birth and sometimes any child is promised to particular individuals. The young woman, Hebrew Alma, designates a young woman of marriageable age without specific reference to virginity. That's a lie. I did a session on it. That's a lie. The Septuagint. Translated the Hebrew term as Parthenos, which normally does mean virgin. And this translation underlies Matthew 1, 23. Emmanuel, the name means with us is God. Since for the Christian, the incarnation is the ultimate expression of God's willingness to be with us, it is understandable that this text was, text was interpreted to refer to the birth of Christ. So it's understandable you misinterpreted. Basically, that's what they're saying. Right? Say what? Who told you Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition is better? Yep. Dewey Rames. That's why I've said. You've heard me say it. Let me tell you again. Let me repeat it again. People ask me the best Bible version. If you understand Elizabethan English, Shakespearean English, if you understand, makes sense? Dewey Rames, King James Bible with the Deuterocanonicals, and they pr produced the King James Bible for Catholics and Orthodox. I've, meant, I've shown you that. I'll show it to you. Those two. If you can understand Elizabethan English. If you can't, then what you got to do is you got to get new King James Version, modern English Version, but they don't have the Deuterocanonicals. So the best I can recommend is ESV, Catholic Edition, but even they have destructive notes. So that's it. That's all you got, buddy. We don't really have much options. Without the church tradition, you don't know what the Bible is, Sissy. You know, you're asking a stupid question, right? How do you know what the Bible is? How do you know what the books of the Bible are that God inspired and preserved without the church tradition? So you ask a very stupid question, Sissy. And if you're asking a stupid question to be smart, Alec, I'll get you out of here. You got it now? You got it? So we, we, we're making sense, right? Let me show you where you can get the King James Bible for Catholics with all the Deuterocanonicals. Because the original 1611 King James had the Deuterocanonicals. 
I have it in my library. I mentioned it, but you can order online. Here it is. Let me show it to you. There it is right here. Here you go. Let me show it to you. I've shown you. I have it in my library. Let me enlarge it. And then we're going to talk a little about John 8. This is all preparatory because I know what Stafford's going to do. He's going to reject the pericope adultery. He has to because it buries him. It shows that Jesus is the Jehovah God of Moses and Jeremiah and the Holy Spirit is Jehovah God. And you know where I'm going with this. Here it is. This one right here. For Catholics. Two volumes. The King James Bible for Catholics with the Dural Canonicals right there. See it? He has to explode. Why does Greg have to reject it? Oh, Jerusalem Bible is bad too, Ryan. Jerusalem Bible, New Jerusalem Bible, forget it. All the modern Catholic Bibles are bad. Jerusalem Bible, New Jerusalem Bible, produced by liberal scholars. They're bad, dude. I'm letting you know. Orthodox study Bible is based on the New King James Version and the New Testament. Exactly. The Orthodox study Bible, their New Testament is New King James Version. Do you know that the Orthodox churches will only pass out King James and New King James Bibles for the New Testament? Did you guys know that? If it's a solid Orthodox church, in their pews, they will give out New King James Version or King James Version. But there's a link right there. There's a link right there. Orthodox Study Bible. The only thing with the Orthodox Study Bible, they're going to give you notes from the Orthodox tradition. So if you're a Catholic, you're going to have to be discerning. You ain't there? You caught it? There it is. There's the link. You see it? You can also get these on Amazon, which I got them from. Amazon, right there. All right. So now this is all preparatory and foundational. All right. So you now know Catholics, your modern Catholic Bibles, they're dangerous. They're destroying your faith. And they're weaponizing the Protestants to say your Catholic Church, your magisterium is a joke. Why? If the magisterium has pronounced fallibly, John 7, 53, 8, 11 is canonical scripture. It's part of John inspired by the Spirit. Mark 16, 9 and 20, canonical scripture, part of Mark. Inspired by the Spirit. And yet modern scholarship says Mark didn't write it. John didn't write it. There are later assertions. What does that say about your magisterium? With friends like these, you don't need James White. With friends like these, you don't need Anthony Rogers, that fat bastard. You get it? NIV, it's one of the worst, but if you can't, yeah, I will bury Zachary Hussein like the Shia buried your mother. Are you Zachary Hussein's lover? Are you his little B.I.H.? You filthy lowlife? Are you, why are you advertising him, you scum? All right, anyway. You need to understand the Bible. So if King James is hard, go with New King James or Modern English Version. But if you need Deuterocanonical, pick up ESV Catholic Edition, read the Deuterocanonicals. NIV is one of the worst, but it's very easy to understand. But overall, overall, I need you to listen. With all the differences, this is a fact. All English versions of the Bible, when it comes to the New Testament, are translating over 90% of the same Greek New Testament text. Let me repeat. Overall, overall, all English versions are translating over 90% of the same Greek New Testament text because the differences between the manuscripts when you collate them and analyze them and the differences between the various versions depending on what manuscripts they prioritize, they will be in agreement up to 97% of the time, anywhere from 92% to 97% of the time, they're in agreement regarding what the text says. The difference is the way they translate. So if I were to talk about the variant readings, the variant readings only impact anywhere from 3 to 
of the tax, only three to eight percent of the tax, but up to 92 to 97 percent, right? They're rendering the same Greek New Testament text. You with me there? The manuscripts that they employ, that they use, that they've collated to translate the New Testament English are so uniform, have such a high level of agreement that the English translations will agree up to 92 to 98% of the time regarding what the Greek New Testament text says. You with me there? So don't exaggerate the differences. What do I mean? Yeah, the differences are few and they are important. But the differences are not such where if I read the NIV in John, I'm going to walk away with a different Jesus, a different father, a different spirit, different message of salvation. You're going to get the same Jesus, same father, same spirit. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Right? Because they're going to be translating approximately up to 92 to 98 percent of the same greek text so this is where you see god has preserved the bible so don't make it more than it is but still though the variants are minor they're still important because they're slowly trying to get you to the point to accept the views of modern scholarship to reject passages that christians have always held to be scripture so the Bible in the hands of these modern critics, it's not safe because it shouldn't be in the hands of critics. The Bible is the possession of the church. The church preserves the Bible by the Holy Spirit, not modern textual critics, many of whom are atheists or agnostic. Okay, you got it? Many of whom are atheists or agnostic. What business do they have to be put in charge of the biblical manuscripts and collate the biblical manuscripts when that's the job of the church. The apostles entrusted the scriptures to the church empowered by the Spirit. The Spirit moved the apostles to give the manuscripts to the church. But now, you see what happened to my hand? Man, damn. Ooh, damn. But now, you have modern textual critics. Many of them are agnostic atheists. I'm not lying. Bart Ehrman is a textual critic. The manuscripts have been entrusted to them, to their collation. Why? Get it, Yoka. Why? I thought the Holy Spirit entrusted the scriptures to the Church of the Apostles and their successors. What are they doing? with our manuscripts. What are they doing collating the Bible? What are they doing telling you what the Bible should be and how it should read? What are they doing? You got it now? All of this said, we got about another 40 minutes so I can prepare for my debate, pray for my success to glorify the Lord. Now, this was all needed to be said. May the Spirit destroy all error in me. Recall the facts correctly. And destroy all sin in me. It's because dealing with Stafford, I have to be wise as a snake, harmless as a dove, because he's a snake who belongs to his father, the dragon. If I use John 7, 53, 8, 11, he's going to reject it. But I don't care. I'm going to still use it for your benefit. Because remember, again, because the New World Translation is based on the views of modern scholarship, look here. They don't have John 8, verses 1, 11. It starts with verse 12. Rejected. Now I'm going to show you why it's rejected. I just did, Luca. Have you been paying attention? It's part of scripture. It's authentic. I'll get you the link later, Matthias. I already mentioned it earlier. Rewind. All right. Do you understand? Do not believe anything and everything a textual critic says. The Christians throughout the centuries accept Mark 16, 9, 20 as authentic, inspired by the Spirit through Mark. John 7, 53, 12, 8, 11, authentic, inspired by the Spirit through John, right? Even Acts 8, 37, and our best manuscripts in Latin Vulgate. 1 John 5, 7, preserved in the Latin stream, which should be considered part of John. Even though we don't have as many Greek manuscripts that have it, who cares? 
We don't have all the Greek copies of the Bible. Many of them were destroyed and deteriorated. So don't care what they say. Ignore what they say. Stick with what the church has told you. Orthodox church, they go with the Byzantine text. That has 1 John 5, 7. That has John 7, 53, 8, 11. Mark 16, 9 to 20. Stick with it. Catholic church, the church has pronounced. Mark 16, 9 to 20, part of scripture. Inspired by the Spirit. John 7, 53, 8, 11, part of Scripture, inspired by the Spirit. Acts 8, 37, and the Latin Vulgate, which the church pronounced to be the official Bible for the Catholic Church in the West because it spoke Latin. 1 John 5, 7 is there. That's it. That's it. Who cares what Daniel Wallace tells you or James White tells you? Who cares? And do not let even Catholic scholarship, Orthodox scholarship that's been influenced and duped by Protestant scholarship to steer you away. Right? To steer you away, correct? So here, even though it's not found in JW.org, that's why I don't care that all the evidence. I go, dude, number one, we don't have every single Greek copy ever written or Latin copy, because many of these copies deteriorated and some were destroyed just because our extant manuscripts <clears throat> are such that we may not have as much evidence for a reading doesn't mean that reading is not authentic. Right? So I don't care what you got to tell me, man. If for over 300 years, God was pleased to honor the King James Bible for English-speaking Christians, and God was pleased to move these Christians, Erasmus, who was a Catholic, to collate Greek manuscripts that have these readings. That means God amen those readings, approved those readings to be read by English-speaking Christians for over 300 years. Right? Unless you believe God was passive and not active in moving his church to collate the right manuscripts that had all the original readings and then to use those manuscripts to produce this Bible with those readings that God wanted. Yes, I am. I'm streaming Rumble, right? I don't care what they say. You don't have all the manuscripts ever written to tell me this definitely wasn't written by John, 1 John 5, 7. The evidence... The manuscript evidence is scanty, right? Even though there are notations by some scribes that noted that 1 John 5, 7 may have been an assertion, they didn't know any better. They were dealing with what they had. But Jerome believed that 1 John 5, 7 was authentic. You want me to show you that? I'm going to finish my series on the Reformers because I didn't finish that. I'm ready. You want me to show you Francis Turretin, a Reform Theologian extraordinaire, loved by Reformed Christians, by Calvinists, such as Turretin Fan. He actually argued for the authenticity of 1 John 5, 7 by appealing to Jerome, or I should say, by appealing to a source that quotes Jerome as saying 1 John 5, 7 was in the Greek manuscripts that he used. May the Lord save me from error. Because, John, I want to try to save your mother from being a Jehovah's Witness because your mother is a spiritual whore. She loves the Jehovah's Witnesses, and that's how she produced you, her bastard son, you spiritual bastard. Why is your mother on the Jehovah's Witness website? Pit on you, you think you're pious, you filthy lowlife. You and your fake piety, you scum. You guys think you're, you're being pious. Here it is. Right here. Reformers, textual variants. Okay, let me see. Let's go here. Oh, sorry. Damn it. Right here. Here it is. I'll do a series. Well, let me show you. Francis Turretin, who hated the Catholic Church, whom Turretin fan loves, who's one of the greatest Reformed theologians, which isn't saying much because Reformed theology is an abomination. He argued for the authenticity of 1 John 5, 7. 
He argued, why? Because he appealed to a document that mentions that 1 John 5, 7 is found in the best Greek manuscripts, and it even cites Jerome saying so, right here. And I got this quote from Turton fan. Thank you, sir. See, here you go. Let's go there. Let's go there. Jerome, what did he say? Or Francis Turton fan. Look what he says about 1 John 5, 7. He says that the Sixtus Sen Senensis, Senensis acknowledges this reading. Now, why is that important? What's the Sixtus Senensis? Thank you, Turton fan, because he gave the citation on his blog, and I copy and pasted it. What did Jerome say? Jerome say about 1 John 5, 7. Here you go. Watch here. Watch here. Jerome and the prologue to 1 John 5, 7 in the Latin Vulgate. Here. Nor did Jerome ever say that it was missing in the Greek codices of the Catholic Church. On the contrary, in the prologue to the canonical epistles to Eustochium, he, Jerome, complains that these words were not translated to Latin by unfaithful and heretical translators. Catholic Church, do you see that? Catholic Church, do you see that? Jerome, my patron saint. What happened to Greg? He's looking for your mother. Jerome, my patron saint. They say he was a fiery man. May I be filled with the spirit as he was and have his knowledge for the glory of Christ, not for my praise. Was upset that the heretics were unfaithful, did not translate 1 John 5, 7 into their Latin copies. Because Jerome said they were widely read in the Greek volumes. Here are the words of Jerome. These are the words of Jerome in the prologue. Guys, you see, Jerome, which epistles, if as they are composed by their Greek authors, were also faithfully translated by interpreters into the Latin language, they would not cause ambiguity to the readers. They would not cause the readers to be confused if they faithfully translate the Greek copies into Latin. Nor would the variety of words conflict with each other, especially in that principal place where we read of the unity of the Trinity in the first epistle of John, in which we also find that much error has been made by unfaithful translators, far from the truth of the faith, because their hatred of the Trinity. Only placing three words. They only place these words, water, blood, and spirit in their own edition. And omitting the testimony of the Father and of the Word and of the Holy Ghost, in which the Catholic faith is particularly strengthened, and the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, are proved to be one in substance and divinity. Thus, Jerome. Catholic and Orthodox. Jerome said, 1 John 5, 7, was in the Greek manuscripts that he had access to, which is why he included 1 John 5, 7 in his edition, though later copies of his Vulgate omitted it. See that? Do you guys see that or no? So, Catholics, who are you going to follow, dude? Here's the article, by the way. Who are you going to follow? Here's it for you guys, too. Who are you going to follow? There's the article. You see how much they're withholding from you? How much they haven't told you? And by the way, the Orthodox, you recognize Jerome as a saint, right? I know you call Augustine blessed, but he's not a saint. But Jerome is a saint, right? Do you guys thought I wasted your time here? Or did this benefit you as preparatory for Stafford? So I don't care what Stafford says about textual criticism. I don't care what he says about the Godhead, because the Godhead, he worships as a false god. I don't care what James White says. They're not my scholars. I don't respect them. All right. See? So now, Orthodox, St. Jerome, the holy saint, my patron saint, he says, it was heretics, 
unfaithful heretics who refuse to include 1 John 5, 7, 4. There are three that bear reckoning of him in the Father, Word, the Holy Spirit. These three are one. And he included it, even though later copies of his fell in the hands of heretics that omitted it, but other copies had it. And he says it's genuine. And he had copies of Greek manuscripts, older than our extent manuscripts, that had it, which is why he decried those that didn't include it. Are you telling me Jerome was lying? Jerome lying? This scholar was lying? That he had access to Greek manuscripts of 1 John that are from the 3rd century, 2nd century, maybe even older, preserved, that had this saying, which he then includes in his Vulgate? Or are you going to go with Daniel Wallace and James White? Because they know more. Even though they don't have the scintilla of the Greek manuscripts that was extant at Jerome's time. Right? There you go. So there you go. Now, with that said, let's talk about John 8 and Stafford's argument response to Kelly. Kelly made the foolish mistake trying to... Tie in John 8, 58 with Exodus 3, 14. I warned him. Go watch my recent response to Shadi Lewis where I butchered his butchering of John 8. So what did Stafford say? Let's open it up. Here's his point. Stafford's argument is that when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. What translation am I using? Hold on, let me go here. Look at the standard Bible. So you see how the Lord has protected us, protected me from falling for these theories, right? <clears throat> Thank you, brother. May the Lord fill me to glorify him all the days. Yep. Yeah, I just didn't know if you recognize him. Guys, focus and help me to help you learn these facts. All right. You see how the Lord in his love protects us? He protect me from buying these views. He wouldn't let me buy into these views. And now the Lord is sharing it with you because what I receive, I pass on to you. All glory to the Father, Holy Spirit. Raphael, your mother is created. She was created in a Shia laboratory to be a Shia whore and a prostitute to give birth to whores and bastards like you. Now, Raphael, if you're more man than your mother and you're not a spiritual whore like your mother, here, I want you to come up and debate me. But we know you're more of a whore than your mother is, and you won't come up, Raphael. Here you go. Raphael, prove to us that your mother is not a spiritual whore, that you're not a bastard son of the Shia who fathered you, and Satan's your father. Come up. Don't hide like your mother did after she did muta with 20 men in an hour. Come up, you filthy whore. We have no respect for you or your mother. Your mother doesn't even respect herself. Because if she did, she wouldn't have given birth to someone like you. She would have taken birth control. And saved us from dogs like you. So come up, you whore, so I can muzzle you for the power of Jesus Christ. You see why I can't be politically correct with these dogs? So your mother was created as a Shia whore. Okay. You there, you little whore? Hello, little bald slut. Hey, was your mother a bitch? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, he just wants to talk. He didn't want to see. He said, he said the Shia was a bald slut who did his mother. No disrespect to bitches. They're both better than your mother. That was it, huh? That's all you had? Did you hear him say? Yes, my mom did muta with a bald slut. That's why she's a slut. I'm a slut. And my mother's a little bitch. Sorry. No disrespect to bitches. The bitch is better than your mother. Anyway, that's all he had. He just, want, he just wanted to swear. So that's why I got rid of him. Okay. Aren't you thankful I'm not politically correct? Let's see. All right. Right? All right. Yes, we know it was a bald slut that did muta with your mother, giving birth to a bastard like you. Don't be upset. I'm ashamed of your mother. That's why you're upset. I don't blame you for being traumatized when you saw your mother that night, 20 Shia on her doing muta with her. Now, are you ready? Let's go into it. The Lord increased our numbers of quality people. May I never be politically correct. As long as I don't shame Jesus, my Lord, but love my Lord. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's his opinion that matters. I don't care what these effeminate queer baits think. Neither should you. John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham's, I am. Now, 
Stafford's argument is that here, Jesus, Jesus is not claiming the divine name of Exodus 3.14. Listen to the argument as I prepare this. Jesus is not claiming the divine name of Yahweh, Jehovah, in Exodus 3.14 because it's not a name. I am is not being used as a name. And I am doesn't mean Jehovah. Now, one of his arguments is this, that if the word I am, the word I am, Jamie, get out of here before I get the she on you. You got five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Jamie, you're a slut like your mother. All right? So here you go. If the word I am was a divine title, this is his argument to Gilly. If the word I am was a divine title, meaning one of the names of God, then why here? John 8, 24. And one of his 15 subscribers got elated. Oh, good one, Stafford. Ooh, no. Here's his argument, okay? John 8, 24, 25. Therefore, I said to you that you'll die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, and it's the same in Greek, ego me, you'll die in your sins. So here's Stafford's point. So they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what I've been saying to you from the beginning. So his argument is, if the words I am was the name of God, pay attention to his objection. Are you ready for the objection? If the words I am, ego me, was the name of God, and the Jews knew that this was one of God's name, why then did they ask, who are you? Didn't they know that he just claimed to be God because he applied? God's name, I am. That's one of they would say, Oh, so you're making yourself out to be God? They didn't understand him to be claiming to be God by using I am. So they didn't take I am as the name of God. Unless you believe I am, well, who are you then? Nor did they try to stone him. That's his argument. You understand his argument? I have to make sure you understand his argument. So I can now pulverize and destroy his argument. Okay, this is all preparatory, the textual issues, everything. So if the words I am, ego e me, are words that function as one of the names of God, that one of God's names happens to be I am, why is it over here when he says, unless you believe I am, ego e me, they didn't understand that he was saying, He's God. Because they asked him, well, who are you then? Nor did they try to stone him for saying, I am. You understand the argument? Are you guys playing Shen Clive before I send you to Iran to make another mess? CZ, it's actually much better than you think. You don't understand his argument. It'll pulverize you if you're not listening. Don't be that arrogant before he humbles you. I've studied the man for years. I understand his arguments. I'll show you how to decimate it. So I can't move on to the refutation if you don't understand his point. His point is the words I am, Greek ego me, or in Hebrew, anihu, anokihu, they are not titles of God. The I am, that phrase, is not one of God's names. It's not. If it was a name of God, that when Jesus says to them, Unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. And if here I am was one of the ways of speaking of God, one of his names or titles, then why did he say, who are you then? They would have known. If he said I am, that means I'm God. Because I am is the phrase one of the ways to refer to God. And then why did they try to stone him? And why did they say, who are you? Because it's not one of his names. You understand his argument? No. Sir, go. You know I'm going to get you out of here, right? Because you're going to embarrass yourself. You're going to humiliate yourself. You're going to destroy yourself because Exodus 3.14, it's not ego and me. You went to Exodus 3.12. Exodus 3.14, it's o on. Ego, a me, o on. Ego, a me, o on. Tell them o on has sent me. Shut your mouth, sir, go, before I get you out of here. Because I told you don't help me. I'm going to humiliate you because you're not helping me. You're embarrassing yourself. Okay, don't be a jackass who needs attention like a narcissist. Okay, everyone with me there? 
Do you understand the objection now? So I can move on? Do you understand the objection? John 8, 24, 25 proves that the I am phrase is not a name for God, according to Stafford. Because if it was one of God's names, then why did they say, who are you? They would know. Oh, he just claimed to be God. And they would try to stone him. So this is his objection. If we got the objection, so what does Stafford say is the meaning of I am, unless you believe I am? He'll tell you that in the context, Jesus is saying, unless you believe I am the Messiah. Because in the context, it's about his Messiahship. So when the Lord says, unless you believe I am, and then you'll know that I am, it means then you're going to know I am the Messiah, not that I'm God. So are we ready to pulverize this objection? Are we ready to pulverize this objection? And I'm not going to decimate Stafford's fake God because his God is not real. His Jesus is fake. It doesn't have the true spirit. He's possessed the right, but not of the true spirit. May we be possessed and filled by the true Holy Spirit. May our loved ones, my daughters, be filled by the true Holy Spirit because we have the true God who's triune. The triune God lives. Stafford's God doesn't exist. Glory to the Father and the Spirit. We ready? Is Jesus saying, unless you believe I am the Messiah? Well, it depends on what you think the Messiah is. Or is he saying, unless you believe I am God? Yeah. Now, I don't expect that the Jews would get it, that Christ is saying that unless you believe I am God, you'll die in your sins because they are shocked, they are baffled, they are horrified, they are scandalized that a flesh and blood Jew speaks this way. So let me unpack it as I go sit down. Number one, the Jews are confronting a man whom they see is a flesh and blood Jew like them. So they're hearing this Jew say things that no God-fearing Jew would dare say. So number two, because of what Jesus is saying about himself, the Jews are scandalized, they're shocked, they're getting discombobulated, they're getting baffled, they're getting rocked at the very core of their foundations because they don't know how to handle this. Because their reaction is disbelief. No way. You understand? It's like, wait, 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 wait. Did we just hear you say what you just said? So they can't believe it. They're getting discombobulated. They're shutting down mentally because they can't believe what they're hearing from this man. So why would you expect that they're going to get it right away? Why wouldn't you expect that the reaction would be disbelief, shock, right? Scandalized, discomb discombobulation. Because they can't figure out what is he, what do you mean? Wait, 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 what do you mean? Unless we believe you you are what you say you are, that you're this I am. I am what? What you're not trying to suggest what we think you're suggesting, right? You get my point? So why would I expect? the Jews, to get it right away when they're being shocked to the very core of their foundation, they're being rocked, they're being scandalized by what a fellow Jew is saying, and that first reaction is like denial. No, 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 that, that, there's no way. No, that, that's, he couldn't have said what he just said, right? But what matters is what Jesus goes on to say and how Jesus clarifies the I am. Bruce, I'm going to send the she on your mother who fathered you if you're not out here in five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Now, that's what I thought, you dumb bastard. I'll bury you in Revelation 3.14 like the she I buried your mother because I've done sessions on Revelation 14. All right, now, you with me there? So, number one, I am not at all surprised that the Jews don't get it. They don't get the implication of the I am statements. Because for them, this is earth-shattering, this is scandalous, and to them it's blasphemous. So they can't believe a Jew would speak like this. So the first reaction is shock. 
They're numbed with disbelief. No way. No, that. But more importantly, number two, how does Jesus break down? How does Jesus explain? How does Jesus explicate the I am sayings? That's what's important. And then as he explains the I am sayings, as he breaks down the I am sayings, and as he further clarifies, we end with, now it sinks in. Now they think, yep, he's claiming to be God. And now they want to kill him because they don't believe it. Everyone with me there? Don't give him too much credit. He's not as smart as Arius. And I'm not as holy and knowledgeable as Athanasius. Do you understand the point? I don't need to repeat it again, right? You understand? Put yourself in their shoes. These are historical accounts, events that really transpired. Put yourself in their shoes and see it from their perspective. Bruce, I'm going to get the Shia on your mother, right? They want to sire another bastard like you. Pit on you and your mother. Bruce. We know Jesus is the angel Lord, but he's not created. The demon, the bastard seed of the Shia keeps manifesting. Or everyone with me there? So if you're in their shoes and a man comes and he speaks as God, your first reaction is, you're going to laugh it off. The guy's crazy. Next reaction is, you're scandalized. Who the hell do you think you are? It's not going to be immediately, right, where you're getting it and it sinks in. It's going to take time to sink in. And that's what the Lord does. Throughout the entire chapter, he breaks down, clarifies what he means and who he claims to be so that by the end, they get it. And now they want to kill him. So now I'm going to break down the context and show you that Jesus is saying more than he's merely the Messiah. He is claiming to be God in the flesh who's not the Father. Now I'm going to prove it. Are we ready? Now I'm going to prove it. Because before we get to 24, let's go back to verse 12. Now clearly they know he's not the Father. Okay, let me read 12. We're going to read here. Because see, they still don't get it to 20. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in the darkness. This is going to be key. But we'll have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness about yourself. That's what you claim. Your witness is not true because we don't know who you are. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness about myself, my witness is true. Why? For I know where I came from and where I'm going. I know who I am. Who is he? The unique divine son of God, equal to the father, who cannot lie and speaks the truth. But that's not good enough for you because you don't believe in who I am. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. So I'm going to bring you another witness. You judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I'm not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the witness of two men is true. I am he who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Now, how was the Father bearing witness? Through the miracles. That's why Jesus says, believe the miracles I'm doing. That's proof the Father is with me, working with me. We work together, and he's confirming what I'm saying. He's amening what I'm saying. The miracles prove it. All right? So pay attention. But they still don't get who he's talking about. So they were saying to him, where is your father? You see? They don't get it. Why the hell would I expect them to get the fact that when he says, I am, he's claiming to be God in the flesh, Stafford. They can't even figure out who is his father. They don't get who he's referring to, Stafford. Jesus answered, you neither know me. You know neither me nor my father. For you, if you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he was teaching in the temple, and no one sees them because his hour had not yet come. Right? So why would I expect them to get the fact that he's claiming to be God when he uses the I am statements when they can't even figure out who his father is? My father bears witness of me. Well, who's your father? You still don't get it? Hello? So who's the stupid one, Kelly, even though he's stupid, or Stafford for being this stupid 
to resort to such pathetic arguments. You get it now? Gee, I'm impressed with your argument, Stafford. Remember, he's the best Aryan apologist. He is. And look how terrible he is, how, how much he sucks, his arguments. Why? Because we have the truth. The triune God is the true God. Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. He'll return as Jehovah in the flesh. The Bible is Trinitarian. So all of you that contradict it by their very nature are easily destroyed. If you know your Bible and are guided by the Spirit. Okay, now. Let me show you that when Jesus says, I am, he's not claiming to be simply the Messiah. What's the first proof? Let's go here. Okay, John 8, 12. Okay, John 8, 12. Watch who he is. Okay, John 8, 12. Okay, get ready now for some fun. And I don't know if I'll have time for the second argument, because I want to wrap it up within 20 minutes, Lord Wing, so I can get ready for the debate. Get ready. You ready? John 8, 12. Okay. Now, let me prove to you that when he says, I am, he means more than I am the Messiah. He means more than, oh, I am the Son of God in the sense that I'm one of the sons of God, part of a heavenly council. He means, I am the Messiah. In that I am the anointed one who is God in the flesh, one with the Father, equal to him in essence and glory. Okay? Are you ready for the evidence? Take it easy, Jordan. I'll show you. Just be patient. Take it easy. It's in about an hour. Take it easy. Focus here more than the debate. So you guys like want UFC. I want exegesis, not debate. John 8, 12. All right. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So he is the light that gives you light, that enlightens you, and whose light dwells in you to lighten your path, right? If you believe in me, I will give you the light that leads to life, the illumination for you to find life, and that life is found in me. Who is the source of that light? Jesus. I am the light of the world. Now, here's the nightmare for Greg, the Aryan heretic. You ready? Here's the nightmare. John 1, 4 to 5. Who is Jesus? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Do you catch it here? The prologue is simply pointing out what the historical Jesus said. I am the light of the world. And if you believe in me, you'll have the light of life. Why? Because he is the source of life. And when you trust in him and receive his light, that light brings you the life that comes from him. He is life. And his life is what gives you the illumination to find life by faith in him. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overtake it. Okay, we got that point. Not only is this the only place where Jesus says he is the life, okay? Let me just show you. Let's hammer this point to bury Stafford's fake God. David, I'm about to remove you. Don't shut up and be patient. Okay. So if you follow Christ, who's the light of the world, he'll give you the light that energizes you and gives you life. Why? Because... His light, it's what illuminates you to find life in him, because life is from him. How do I know? John 11, 25, 26. John 11, 25 to 26. Okay. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I, I. Now, according to Stafford, this is a creature who is not Jehovah. So a creature says, I am the resurrection, the life. See why he's a blasphemer and tool of Satan? Use of the dragon? So I keep challenging him, which he'll never answer. How many of you are going to bet me? He cannot answer these objections when I say, show me a single verse in the Old Testament, because the New Testament does not contradict the Old Testament. Show me a single verse in the Old Testament 
where a creature is said to be the life, the resurrection. Show me. Show me that there's a creature alongside of God, and that creature says, I am the resurrection of life. Show me. Zach, the she are looking for your whore mother. Zach, I've already buried John 20, 17, as if she had buried your mother. All right? He who believes in me will, leave, will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. I myself am the life. I myself the resurrection. No one comes to the Father but through me. Again, Stafford. Guys, how many of you guys will bet me he'll never answer this? Will you answer this? Jesus Yahweh, that's not a translation. That's a paraphrase. Take it easy before I get you out of here. I'm going to get you out of here for quoting that. That's a paraphrase. That's not what the Aramaic literally says. Okay? Here's my challenge, Stafford. Show me in the Old Testament a spirit creature in heaven alongside of God who says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Please. Why can't you answer this, you Bible pervert? Why don't you answer this if you're not a coward and your God is real? But now it's going to get worse. Show me in the Old Testament. Show me in the Old Testament where a spirit creature is said to be the one who has life in himself and that life he gives to others. Please. You guys think he'll answer me? Anyone think he'll even answer me? Will he answer me? Please. A creature in the Old Testament who says or said of him, in this creature is life, and that creature gives life to everyone else. So does he give life to himself, you Bible pervert? Your God is fake, Stafford. You are of the dragon. Repent. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overtaken. Now watch the burial. John 1, 8 to 10. John the Baptist was not the light. The Baptist was not the light. But he came to bear witness about the light. He came to bear witness about the light. He came to testify about Jesus. Now, who is Jesus? There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens everyone. Jesus is who? He is the true light, the source of light, who brings illumination to everyone. He then was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Now, how many of you are going to bet me he's not going to answer this question? Okay. Here's my challenge, Stafford. I know you're watching this. Bible pervert. Worse than Kelly. At least Kelly worships the true God, even though he's stupid. Doesn't know how to defend it. Bible pervert. Don't play clips of arguments I destroy your Jude 9 and Zechariah 3, which you've never recovered from. And your 1,000-hour response. Please show me in the Old Testament where a creature is said to be the true light, where a spirit creature alongside of Jehovah is said to be the true light. And I want you to explain how can the creature be the true light because true here means source of light. And Safford acknowledges, why is it that Jesus, the creature, is the source of light when the source of light can only be the creator? Jehovah. And here's proof. Here's proof. Psalm 36, 9. Speaking of Jehovah, for with you, Jehovah, is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. You see why this is humiliating for this Bible pervert? The Old Testament says the source of life is Jehovah. The Old Testament says it is Jehovah's light that illuminates us. But according to this Bible pervert, the creature not the creator Jehovah, is the source of light. The creature 
not Jehovah, is the fountain of life because life comes from him. He is the resurrection life and the life. See how this buries his Arianism? You see how this buries his Arianism? Are you seeing it, right? And this is just part one. I had to prepare the groundwork for what's to come. Oh, it's going to get so bad for him. See it? So understand what this Bible pervert who's possessed by an evil spirit until he repents is telling you. The creature, Archangel Michael, he is the true light. Yet the Old Testament says Jehovah is the true light. The creature, the Archangel Michael, he is the resurrection and the life. And it's from his life we receive life and illumination. Old Testament says Jehovah is the life. And he is the source of life. And receive life and illumination from him. See the blasphemy? Psalm 27, 1. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is a strong defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Do you see why his God is fake? His religion is fake? And why he's getting destroyed and obliterated and annihilated? Only Trinitarianism can make sense of this. Only Trinitarians can make sense of it. Yes, Jesus is not a creature. He is the Almighty Creator, Jehovah in the flesh. So yes, as the Creator, He is the true light, the source of light. Light. We receive light from him, and he is the source of life because he's not a creature, he's Jehovah. So he is the life. He is the resurrection. He's the one who gives us life. He's the one who gives us illumination. But he's not the only person. The Father is Jehovah. The Spirit is Jehovah. So Jesus, with the Father and the Spirit, the three as the one God, they are the true light. They are the source of life. They are the life. This is why the Bible says this. We're going to wrap it up more in part two. Okay? Watch here. Notice three and only three. There is no fourth, Stafford. Only three. And these three alone, look what it says about them. Okay? T tell me, coincidence? These three alone? John 5, 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, See, the Father gives light because he's Jehovah. Even so, the Son also gives light to whom he wishes because the Son is Jehovah, John 5, 21. But wait, John 6, 63. The Spirit is the one who gives life. Is it a coincidence? Three and only three. Only the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are set to give life. The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit in our life. So the spirit gives life. John 6, 63. The son gives life to whom he wishes. John 5, 21. The father gives life. John 5, 21. Trinity right in front of your eyes. You blind, demonized loon. See? Lord willing, this ends part one. We had an excellent crowd. We have over 700. I will be live streaming the debate here on my channel. So Lord willing, on Rumble and on YouTube, but here's the location debate. I need your prayers. God will give me the grace to destroy the blasphemy and be humble because God can humble me. He doesn't need me to win. Even if I lose the debate, Jesus is still God Almighty. He won't get the throne. But pray that I can destroy the lies lovingly and win this guy over. It's on standing for truth. Stacy Tuberville have already debated. So pray for me. That I can be humble, bold, patient, because he's a nice guy, though he doesn't have the truth. God constrain me not to be mean. He's a sweet guy, but here it is. But I'll be playing it here. So let's make this go viral for the glory of Christ. Here it is. He's, a, he's actually a very nice guy. Pray for his salvation, not his destruction. So what was the point? Let me now wrap it up real quickly. Here's the link. What was the point? Okay, when he says, I am, in the context, only someone demonized, a deceiver would think that he's merely saying, I am the Messiah, when in the context, he already just got done saying, 
I am the light of the world, which is a title to divinity. Only God is the light of the world, the source of light, who gives you illumination and life. So in the context, when he says, unless you believe I am he, or you'll die in your sins, he already told you what you're supposed to believe. For unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins, he told you. You must believe I am the light of the world. But for him to be the light of the world, he must be Jehovah Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. And this is just the beginning. Here's the moderator, by the way. Pray, standing for truth. God, keep me humble and gracious, not get arrogant so he doesn't humble me. And I can win Stacy over because he's hilarious and we want him to get saved. Lord willing, if you love me for the sake of the Lord, bathe me in your prayers, my daughters. Cry out to the Lord. I need discipline to conquer my appetites. Die to lust, food addiction, stay healthy, intermittent fasting, and fast as an act of worship. Obey the Lord Jesus. Love him. My daughters stay healthier than me. Fall in love with Jesus. And the Lord gives me at least 20 years to see him grow up to be godly women. And they're in my life. I die in their arms. And God bless this young woman in my life that I can be Jesus to her. And we come together in purity and not shame the Lord, love the Lord, and provide for ministry. See you, Lord willing, in about an hour and 43 minutes. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. Love you, Holy Spirit. Please, Son of God, purify us in your blood, our loved ones, my daughters. Seal us by spirit to never shame you and fall into scandal, but love you, Lord Jesus, and adore you, Lord Jesus, and heal me of my vices. Give us the power to finish rest because you are alive. You live. You are reality. You are alive, and we will live forever because you are forever, and we thank you, Lord Jesus. Help me now to destroy the lies of Stacy and win him over, Lord, and not shame you. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Maranatha. Take care.